Welcome to Senior Strategies. I am your host, Amy Decker, Director of Client Services for Senior Helpers. We are so glad that you were able to join us today for lively conversations with guests that can offer you the tools, strategies, and support so that you can successfully stay on your journey as a caregiver. We hope that you enjoy yourself and find just what you needed to get you through today. Hi, welcome to Senior Strategies. I am Amy Decker, Director of Client Services with Senior Helpers. Uh, today, I'm really excited about the guests that I have on. Um, Heidi and I have been friends for 10 plus years. Uh, we've known each other a long time. There's been a lot of growth. We've all done different things since we've met each other. Um, I'm very proud of her because now she owns her own firm and um, she has a lot to be blessed just with that. But the purpose for me to have her on the show today is she is the number one poster child for being a caregiver, not only for her children, but for her parents. And I think she has a lot of um, challenges she can talk about, a lot of successes that she can share with you, and even some points um, of things that she learned on her own. So I'm excited to have her on. And again, on the posts on both YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram, feel free to post any comments, any questions for Heidi, and then I'll pass them on to her. But welcome, Heidi Friedman. I'm happy to have you on. You're a dear friend of mine. And I know you wear 14 different hats. One of them is owning your own elder law firm, which I'm so proud of you for that. Um, thank you, thank but you. as of late, you've been caregiver- extraordinaire. Um, but let's, let's kind of go back a little bit, introduce yourself. Mm -hmm. And then let's talk about how you really started your caregiving uh, journey. Ah, so uh, again, Heidi Friedman, I am a board certified elder law attorney. Um, if you can believe this, there's only about 115 of us that are board certified in the elder law arena. Um, so, you know, I got my start um, at Silk Off with you. I actually started in this arena because of a caregiving situation that I ended up with. So that's how I got started in this whole process. I mean, before this, this is not the kind of law I was practicing. Um, so I kind of fell into it based on life experiences. So, and you've almost been there with me from almost the beginning. Yes. If you can yes. That, right? like to so I say, I'm so proud of you. you. I need to tell you this, but I think it's been longer than 10 years, but of course we met when we were like five. We were five. Uh, that's <laughs> right. So maybe it's been like 20 years. <laughs> yeah, like 20, 20 years. Think of when, what's your earliest memory of being a caregiver? Ah, uh, so my earliest memory. So, I, I mean, I, I think I grew up with the typical dream that all of us like, you know, I hate to say it, but Jewish little princesses grew up with. I thought I was going to get married. I figured I'd have my own little career, um, my house, my my 2.5 children, you know, and just everything being perfect. And as we all know, you know, you plan and God laughs. So things did not quite work out for me the way that I wanted it. I um I had started, I was practicing. I was, you know, very involved in a mid-sized firm. I I enjoyed what I was doing. I was representing a um a, a large university. I was lobbying. I really enjoyed it and decided that it was time to have my first child and, you know, had no anticipation that anything would be amiss. Why would I? I was right. young. I was you know, in my early 30s, figured I want to have a baby. Boom. I'd have a baby. Well, little did I know that it would take us up to three years to finally get pregnant. Um, we were literally one month away from doing in vitro when I got pregnant. And then we were so excited to get pregnant. And then um, when I was about 26 weeks pregnant, we found out that there were some issues with the baby. Mm -hmm. And um, I was offered a late term abortion to run to Kansas City for a late term abortion, which of course, wow. I mean, 26 weeks, you know, it's like, you know, right. at that point, it's a baby. I, I, and we had tried so hard. So I wasn't going to do that. Um, so my caregiving experiences really started or basically when Jeremy was born, and that was in 2000. And um he was born by emergency C-section. I had a, a host of different issues that had happened. And um, he ended up in the NIC unit for about eight weeks, which is the, you know, basically where I, I, I was literally told the first night or the first or second night that um, there was really no hope for him. Wow. Um, so we had, um, yeah, he had a lot of different issues. He had, uh, you know, if you, you know, thrombosis of the brain, he had contractures of the hand, he had blown two two holes in his lung and his, so he was on oh 100% oxygen. He had club feet, undescended testicles, hypotonia. So all this host of stuff. So I literally 
quit my job from the hospital. I, I literally did. I, I mean, I knew I was going to have to to somehow rebuild him and was given very little hope um, by way of doctors telling us that, you know. So no real there support was not or hard. direction or anything. So here you are quitting no. your job yeah. now as an attorney to take on this full time yep. job and not really getting any kind of medical support from anybody. That's awful. No. And the interesting and, and the crazy thing was, so, I mean, I was, I, I loved being a lawyer. I loved what I did. So if you can believe this, I had, while I was pregnant, I literally had found a woman who took care of three or four babies and she lived close to my office. And I honestly thought, oh, I'll give birth to this baby. I'll go back to work. I'll go see the baby during lunch and dinner because I work however many hours. And, you know, I was going to be that, that mom that had yeah, it all. Right. Um, so it was kind of just a, a, a rude awakening for me. Wow. Um, yeah. So eight weeks or nine weeks, I don't really remember in the NIC unit. Um, we were very blessed with some really incredibly special doctors and nurses. It, it's funny because I take on everything at a hundred percent. Right. So um, all do. of a sudden I was yeah. in the NIC unit from, yeah. yeah, from morning to night, like, you know, from the minute that they let us in as parents, to the minute they, they let us go home, I became like, you know, I would, I would, I became like a nurse. Yeah. <laughs> I would hear right. machines go off and yell to the other nurses. It's calibrating. Don't <laughs> worry. I, nurse. Um, wow. I literally learned how to take him home on an NG tube. I don't know if anybody knows what that is, but like a, a tube through the nose, I had to learn how to put it in him. So we went through a host of different things and everywhere I turned, I was told that Jeremy would not be able to walk. He would not be able to talk. he will never be able to function. Um, and so I, just didn't stop. I, so did I you ever told, get help at home? So once you brought this baby home that needed all this help, you didn't have any kind of like in-home nurse that would come in and work with you. You, you did no. this all on your own. I did this all on my own. It's really funny. It's wow. interesting because my mother at that time, so I finally had brought Jeremy home. And when I brought him home, he was on all kinds of monitors and, and things like that. So um, when my mother came, when I first brought him home and she finally said, we were both laying, you know, we would lay in the, in the living room and watch him. And she finally said to me, um, Heidi, you know, if you're going to sit here and watch him at the same time, I'm going to watch him. I might as well go home, go get some sleep. So I said, okay, I'm going to go get some sleep. You're fine. You're fine. And she said, yeah. So I go into the bedroom. I go finally fall asleep. And within, you know, I would say 20, I, I mean, I fell dead asleep because, you know, you can just imagine that I was exhausted. Exhausted. Yeah. Um, within like, 10 minutes, I think my mother starts screaming my name and I open oh. my eyes and I think, wow, did I sleep? How, how long did I sleep? I got you scream my name. And I came running out and Jeremy had had some kind of episode where just everything, mucus, everything was coming out of his mouth, his nose, whatever he wasn't breathing. Oh my um, goodness. From being in the NIC unit for so long and seeing what the other nurses were doing, I knew instinctively what to do. I don't, I don't know how, but I suctioned him. We got him breathing immediately. And I looked at my mother and I said, you can go home if you want to, but I'm never leaving this baby side. Oh my goodness. So at that point, it was just pretty much all me. And yeah. he had severe feeding issues. Um, he, um, had aspiration pneumonia. Um, he had, you name it, this, this I, I call him my $6 million baby because we literally have rebuilt him from head to toe. Yeah. And it was, it was a huge adjustment for me because I had never taken care of anybody who had special needs. I mean, I grew up in Jacksonville. I don't even think we knew anybody who had special needs. Right. I knew one kid in high school that had an arm that did this and that was it. I, yeah, I didn't know anybody right. who had that. So it was a really weird experience. So that well, was when and like, also you're a mom with a giant me. heart. So I think it wasn't, there wasn't even a question like, well, what am I going to do? I can't take, no. you knew you were the mom. I created you. I'm going to keep you alive. I'm going to do whatever I can to oh, keep yeah. you alive successfully. And it was yeah. literally by you putting your entire life on the back burner because of it. Oh, my entire life. I, and everything changed. I mean, my whole life changed. My, my life changed with my husband, with Jeremy, um, Jeremy, you know, had to have his feet fixed. So it was, and, and all night long, we'd be up or the problem with Jeremy is that he had such asper he had such reflux, um, severe that if I fed him, first of all, he had a cleft palate too. So wow. it would take me an hour to feed him two hours. And, and he was hypotonia, which I don't know if you, that's very floppy baby. So it would take me like an hour to feed him. But if I moved like this, 
he'd throw it up. So oh, I literally have to feed him and not, and not move. move. Um, I created a bottle. I actually developed a bottle, um, which when I went to see, when I took him to Miami Children's Hospital at one point, they really wanted to patent it. I just didn't have, I just didn't have the head to do it. Um, it, it was because I had to start giving him thick liquids, but he, he was still a baby. They wanted me right. to, to use like a straw. And right. I was like, you can't use a straw on a baby. What am I going to do? So I created this bottle and I did what I had to do. And he was on a feeding tube. We took him to different programs. I spent three months in a program in West Virginia, um, whatever he could do. And thankfully he is 24 years old. He's amazing. He walks. He is he amazing. I've told you several times, I think he needs to run for president because he's full he's of so self-confidence. Yeah. He's got yeah a sense of humor to die for. He's completely he adorable. Does. He's cute with his friends. Like I adore Jeremy. How old was yeah. he before you realized, okay, we're over the hump and I think he's going to be okay. And things are good. Like how long were you in that stage of, Ooh, man. Um, I think it was, I will tell you when I got pregnant. So I have a second one, dear Max. Mm -hmm. And, um, of course I get pregnant with my second one. Um, thinking this is going to be you know, we didn't know. Cause to be honest with you, Jeremy has no diagnosis. So that's the other thing. I have no diagnosis. We've had him tested. We've had every hormone, everything tested. And there's nothing that comes back wrong. Saying with what this was. I love, there's a, a poem that's called uh, welcome to Holland. And it's this whole poem about if you have a child with special needs, you know, when you're pregnant, you're packing for Italy. Everybody's going to Italy. You love Italy. You're so excited. You learn the language. You can't wait to see everything in Italy. Right. And you're in the middle of the plane, and as the plane is landing, the pilot goes, "Welcome to Holland." And you're like, "Wait, I, oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to Holland for Italy. Italy. Oh, that's yeah, cute. I, I, whatever." <laughs> and you get to Holland, and then, but you realize Holland is a little bit slower, a little bit different, but it's just as amazing and wonderful. So, it's like this perfect poem that's written by a mom who has special needs. And it's just, it, it's just it, it exactly ex explains how you feel. But with Jeremy, I just, I, I just never stopped to take in the thought that he may never do the things that they told me he would never do because mm -hmm. I, it just wasn't an, it just wasn't an option for us, for me. And because um, so you yeah. had such a positive outlook and such a positive attitude with him, he, as an adult man now at 24, truly believes he is just as capable as the next person to run for the Olympics, run for president, run for, you've raised right. him with such self-confidence and such positiveness from day one. That's yeah. why he's flourishing and so successful right now. Had you have looked back and go, Ooh, what if you get the flu? I'm not going to let you do that. What if, what if you get sick and yeah. you were like, bud, you're, you're my star. And, and that's why well, he's flourishing. To realize that I had done such, and I don't mean to pat myself on the back, but I had done such a good job. You have not done, isolating oh Jeremy as a kid with special needs. Right. That his brother has no, to this day. I mean, he's 20 years old, my, right. my son, Max. He's still like, why can't Jeremy do the same thing that I do? Because right. I never wanted to, to do that. But as far as caregiving, it was definitely an eye-opening experience to care for a child with special needs. All kinds I think of because you learned things. so much and realized how much it was an impact on your life. I think that's also why you actually have a segment of your elder law firm now that you also focus on special needs because you're realizing too, look what it did to your life. Look at the decisions you had to make. Look what you had to do to be an advocate for your son, but then you yeah. pursued it even further. Well, it's interesting that you should say that because I tend to be the the shoemaker's kid without the shoes, right? So I talk to to parents with kids with special needs. You need to have a special needs trust for them. You need to do a guardianship. You need to blah, blah, blah when they turn 18. Because what people don't understand is it doesn't matter what the mentality is of a, of a person, whether they are only at a mentality of a first grader or, or a fifth grader. If they turn 18, they become an adult in the eyes of the law. Right. So you have to either do one of two things. You either have to do a guardian advocacy for them, which is a, a, a way to do it if you're a parent of a child with special needs, or you have to get a durable power of attorney. So, and you have to make sure that you have a special needs trust for them because you don't want them to get any kind of assets in their name so that you can qualify them for social security, or it's actually it's a supplemental secure income mm -hmm. um, and Medicaid so that they can get, they can get benefits. And my son turned 18, he turned 19, and all of a sudden I was like, <laughs> whoops, yeah. 
maybe I need to do this stuff for my own children, right. for my own son. Right. So I did. I, 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 you know, I put together a special needs trust. I put together my trust. But that happened to me when I took care of my parents, too. So, I mean, I, I'm one of those, I, I preach a lot about what you're supposed to do, but then tend to not do it in my own backyard. And it's a real eye-opening experience when you're not prepared for what happens. It, it and really I don't is. think anybody is truly prepared. They think they are in their mind and you're teaching other people to be prepared until it smacks you right between the eyes. And then, so so moving forward yeah. then, now we've got Jeremy, he's 24, he's successful. He's a great kid. Everybody loves him. Yep. Things are going well. You've got your own firm and then your mother gets sick. Yes. Yeah, so my mother got sick in 2018. Uh -huh. um, she was diagnosed with ovarian cancer. Um, and um, it was, it was a smack in the face. I, I mean, I know, you know, I was extremely, extremely oh close to my mother. Yes. We were like, she was literally my best friend my whole life. And um, we get hit with that. She's got ovarian cancer. In January 2019, she has surgery. She's supposed to have surgery. So um, when she got home, I took care of her for a little bit when she got home, but then she was fine. So we were good. They, they said they got all the cancer. So in August, I was working for a, a larger firm. I decided to open up my own practice in August, whatever. My mom gets re-diagnosed with cancer in October or November. By the next year, they want to, um, or they want to do a different kind of, of chemo for her. And um, they said it was going to cause her all kinds of different issues. I took her to her chemo. At that time, it was not yet COVID. And we decided to, she needed in a home health agent. She needed to bring in a home health aid because after the key, after that particular chemo, it really knocked her out. Yeah. And she was living with my dad and stuff, but my father, God bless him, was not the best caregiver. Aww. Like he would be carrying a bowl of soup and he'd trip and dump oh, all the soup. Gosh. You know, I go to the, to, to take care of her for the second, this kind of chemo. And I'm there for the weekend. And I say, mom, you know, I'm going to bring in a home health aide. Please do me a favor. She's coming on Monday morning. Please do me a favor. Don't get up. Don't do anything till she gets here. She's going to help you. You're a little weak, you know, just make sure that, that when the, the aide gets up, then you can go take a shower and she'll help you everything. Well, I drive home on Sunday and um, that morning, the next morning on Monday morning, I get a phone call from the home health agency basically saying that they took your mother to the hospital. Apparently, my mother, despite the fact that I had asked her, please just wait for the aid to get there, decided that she needed to take a shower before the aid got there because she oh. needed to be clean. Uh -huh. And she slipped and fell and broke her femur and her uh. hip. And um, they were taking That's like the her person that cleans their house before the house cleaner comes. So that the house looks exactly. My mother was always like that. She yeah. just, you know. So let me take a quick shower. Oh. Right. She was always so perfect. My mother was beautiful, perfect. Her makeup yes. was always done. Just yes. that person. So and she now her femur and what else? Her hip. Oh. So her hip and her femur. She fell on the. And meanwhile, she had fallen in the shower, you know, getting out of the shower. Um, the story was that she called for my dad, who was already working. He worked out of the house and he finally came. He couldn't get her up because oh. he's. And so they had to call the ambulance. And here my mother is poor, my poor mother naked. Oh, <laughs> that's right. She's been oh, dying. Because she was in the shower. Oh. She was not in the shower. So I'm sure she was dying because that's, yes. just, you know. Just imagine that that generation, you know, now we'd be like, oh, we don't care if we're naked. But right. that generation, we cared. And um, they're taking her to the ambulance, but they won't let my dad into the hospital because COVID is starting. Mm -hmm. So I'm calling my dad and we can't get in touch with my mom. Eventually, I finally got in touch with her for her cell phone. She is out of it. Like she is. And she tells me they're they're putting her in surgery that night, that night, oh. not talking to any of us. This is how bad it was with COVID. Right. So they give my mom surgery. Now they're shutting down all the rehabs. This is like the beginning of COVID. Oh. They're shutting down all the rehabs. But my mother was a big, she did a lot of fundraising and stuff for one of the, the nursing homes in Jacksonville. So we were able to get her into rehab at River Gardens. The problem was they were rehabbing her leg and everything, but they couldn't give her the chemo because they couldn't take her out of the rehab to give her the chemo. You know, who cares if you can walk if you're dead? They got to get you the chemo. So we're trying to navigate that whole system. And again, just terrible because you're trying to navigate that system. Yes. 
during COVID. And, and nothing, everything was upside down with COVID. Like nothing everything, ran everything. the way it was supposed to at all. They wouldn't let you in the room. They won't let you, whatever. My father can't go visit. We're trying to talk to my mom. She's oh. out of it half the time. It was really horrible. And so I was going to come in for the weekend. And um, I ended up staying for six weeks until oh. until her death without and it was a 24 hour seven yeah. 24 seven hour caregiving experience for me juggling caregiving of my mom my dad wanting some help and assistance sure and still being my practice which thankfully I was able to do online because of COVID right so was, but your um, dad also needing emotional support and mental my support father, and respite exactly. from, you know, and so on top of everything else, now you are caring for two parents mm -hmm. with every single aspect of your body, emotionally, mentally, physically, yep. all yep. of it. I'm going to be honest. It's really interesting to me. And the same thing happened to me with my dad. But what's really interesting to me is I will have clients that will come and talk to me about, you know, oh, I'm going to have my parent move in with me and I'm going to take care of them. And I'm always like, yeah, let's see how long that lasts. You really right. should bring in an aid, whatever. And going through the experience myself, I now understand why somebody makes that decision, right? right? I, I understand that it was like, I couldn't hand over that care of my mom to somebody else. Right. The night that I decided I'm going to go home for just for a couple of days because I have kids at home. I mean, remember, right. I still had kids at home. Right. They're with my ex-husband for all this time. Um, and I said to my mom, I'm going to go home for, for just for the day. And I'm going to come back in two days. My mother fell off the bed that night, broke her hip again. It, it was just, it was a nightmare. And then when she was in um, hospice, you know, listen, I'm a lawyer. So there's a lot of times I get things done that some people don't hospice at right. that point was telling us, oh, you can only have one person in at a time and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, right. yeah, that's not going to work. Hospice. No, that's so, not going to work. I am. Um, it's not going to work. We have family coming and, and stuff like that. So we were able to get everybody that we needed in good the room to say goodbye good. to my mom and, and everything before she passed. Quite, quite. Yeah. And that was, that was just so taxing because you literally, again, had put your entire life on the back burner, sleeping on the couch, you know, doing what you have to do. And so yeah. then your mother passed, which then that took time for you just to digest that and get used to that and figure out how to get your life back on track. And let's, you know, let's get our job going. And how are my boys doing? And then your dad. Yeah. So how much, um, how much later than was it when your dad got sick? So my dad totally changed at that point. And that's something I also didn't expect. And I think that people should understand it was very challenging for me to deal with my dad. Um, how did he change? Like, was he depressed? He had a broken heart. He became maybe yeah, more well, angry all, that this is had, where his life was. You know, what were his changes? So they were, they were supposed that year, they would have been married 60 years. Aww. So you can just imagine that yeah. most of his lifetime with my mom. Um, but it was weird because he um, didn't act like my dad. He wasn't comforting to me. Um. Cause he was too, he was too busy dealing with his own issues grief. and sadness, uh -huh. it was a, his own grief and how he was handling it. And it was a real eye opener. And I think that it's, it's a, a challenging thing for any child to understand that the surviving parent is going through it also. Mm -hmm. um, so, and he was, became afraid of, of touching us or whatever, because of COVID and um, I would go, I came home and then obviously when I would go back, it would be so devastating to me that I, I literally would be on the floor crying hysterically Aww. and my father would walk past me oh my and goodness. not say anything. And, and maybe because he felt like he was just so drained emotionally on his own that he probably couldn't offer even a hug because that would have sent him right over the hard. edge. I mean, what, maybe, I don't know. Oh, that's I, I sad. don't, I don't know. But it was emotionally devastating. Um, devastating. Yeah, that was the word I was looking for. I was going to say exhausting, but devastating to me. Um, and uh, and you know the other issue is um, my son, my children, right? So especially Max, my my twenty year old, had to witness the devastation that I went through. And yeah. you know, you again, you don't you don't think about that. Uh, you know, there was one time I went to my parents' house 
and the boys came and I had just was just over over the edge and I was literally laying on the floor just crying 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 and in comes walking my son and I didn't have the the strength to pull myself together for him and say I'm okay I, I, I didn't have it some people say that's good your children should know that you're human I don't know if that was good for him or anything and um and I think that's the biggest part of this program is it's for caregivers because caregivers do what you do. They run themselves into a brick wall and now they're not even good for themselves or anybody else around them because you haven't had time for yourself. But in your mind, you're, you were in survival mode again. You're back into survival right. mode. It's, it's hard and I have to forgive myself. And I think that's the hardest thing that a caregiver has to, to overcome is the guilt that you feel. Um, and being able to forgive yourself. And I still have guilt. Um, you know, did I do enough? Did I get a second opinion? Did I, I wasn't there the night she right. died. Um, right. how, did, was I okay for my children? You know, did I mess up? My, I always used to say, no matter what though, when my kids were born, listen, my kids are going to end up on somebody's couch, <laughs> blaming me for something, no matter what I do, because that's just what kids do. Right. Right. That's right. We all do. We right. all blame our parents right. for whatever issues we have. Um, but I tried, you know, did I, did I, was I strong enough for my kids? You know, um, was it okay for me to be that weak and that, and it that is, gone? it's okay to be uh, vulnerable. It's okay to be weak. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay to not be okay yeah. for you and for those around you. And they can see there was a time period you weren't okay, but now you're okay again. You know, everyone goes yeah. through peaks and valleys with their life. And so for them, if they kind of had time in their life when they're not okay, they're going to say, well, you know what, mom, you were there and somehow you got yourself yeah. out of it. So if anything, you were just a good example of not being okay for a while and still being a strong person and still keeping your life together. Yeah. I mean, and yes, I can look back on it and see that. But again, as that caregiver, yeah. as that person, it's just, it's hard to get there. And, um, and your brain think, is overthinking itself and you're overthinking and course. overthinking and overthinking. I think as a female, we do that anyway. So yeah. you're going to overthink yeah. every single decision that you made and what you should have done differently. And, but that's, yeah. I think that's very common with a caregiver too. Yeah, I do too. And, and it's interesting that I now understand that a lot more um, before I might've just poo pooed. Oh no, you were fine. I'm sure you're okay. You right. did whatever. But now I, I, I really can understand um, that guilt that you feel that you yeah. never did enough. Listen, eventually my father found a companion, got a, a, a girlfriend or whatever, and, and had a life. I mean, it, it wasn't the same life I think he expected with my mom for sure, but he had a life. And Early in April this year, he was sleep. He had a hard time sleeping, got up in the middle of the night because he was sleeping on the couch and tripped over his own feet and fell flat forward onto his face. Luckily, he was able to yell, hey, Siri, call my little brother. And, and so my little brother was able to come over and, oh my God, the pictures of my dad are just pit black and blue here. And he fell flat on his face. Oh my goodness. Um, and then... um. His birthday was April 21st. My birthday is April 19th. So the week after that, I went home and noticed my father was just sitting on the couch, not moving, like never moving, sleeping a lot of the time. Nobody knew that he had gone to the doctor and there was an issue with his blood. No, mm -hmm. his, his girlfriend told me. Right. And at that point, though, I did talk to my brothers. I'm like, I think we need to bring in home health care for dad. Yeah. And. Here's another issue that I think family members don't know is that, or don't anticipate is the, 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 the siblings or the, the, the family dynamics not agreeing with everything, yeah. not agreeing with everything. My brothers were like, he's fine. We're, we see him every yeah. day. You just family dynamics are huge. Family dynamics are huge, huge. especially huge. when it comes to such an emotional decision. Yes. I see the change. I'm like, he is not fine. Right. There's, they're like, he's fine. That's who he is. I'm like, oh. So it was a little bit of a struggle to get everybody to agree. And my father didn't want home health care. That's another issue. You know, you're dealing with so many different things. And, um, but finally I convinced everybody to, to get him home health care. And um, he uh, went to the doctor, this crazy thing. Like he goes to the doctor, he goes to the blood doctor, whatever. I made sure I was on the phone for the first one. The second one, his girlfriend called me and said, there's just something wrong. He went home. 
we were getting a home health aid. And when she told me, when she called me and told me my father was so lethargic that she had to put him in a wheelchair to take him to the doctors. Oh my goodness. I started packing a bag. Yeah. Right. I need to go home. And then you have to mm-hmm. decide now what you're going to do with him. Now he's got to go back home. Are exactly. you going to put him on hospice? Are you going to get a, you know, a, a caregiver to right. come in and take care of him? There were so many decisions. Now you have to make so many to decisions at that point. Third time around. Right. We had no idea what was even wrong with him. And it was really interesting. My father was lethargic, but if you asked him a question, he could answer it. Uh-huh. By the next day, they realized that his CO2 levels had um, something out of whack. They tried to clear him out and um, ended up having to intubate him. I know I had done healthcare directives for my parents right. and durable power attorney. We could not find the healthcare directives. Oh. Now my father's out of it. He's getting intubated and I can't find the actual healthcare directives. Luckily, I was able to find the durable power of attorney that said I still had the ability to make healthcare decisions. But let me tell you something. That is so incredibly important. I can't stress it enough for people to make sure that not only do their families, their parents, anybody over the age of 18 yes. have a durable power attorney and healthcare directives, yes. they know where they are. The other thing that is so important, my father was on so many different medications. We had no idea. Oh. My brothers and I had no idea. And finally, we also didn't know what my dad's passwords were oh. for his phone. For his computer, for all right. we didn't. Right, know. yeah. I tell my clients all the time: make sure your parents have the healthcare directors. Make sure yes. your parents have the durable power attorney. Make sure you know what medications they are on. Yes. Make sure you, you know get their passwords. Passwords, right? Yeah, we didn't know. We had no. We didn't know. Thankfully, my father was still cognizant enough to answer our questions. Good. So when we was, Dad, what is your password for your phone? For his phone, he was able to tell us. Good. What's your password for your bank accounts? And again, it was the other thing. I didn't know if my father had beneficiaries on his bank accounts. I didn't know what my father had. Right. So it's. So it's good so to have those conversations when they're healthy and have, right. have it together so that they can, you can make decisions as a group. And you can right. write that information down. And you and your brothers then would be, fortunately, he still had you know, his cognitive ability was still in good shape that he could answer those questions. But yeah, you're right. Who thinks of that? Nobody. You don't think about that. And here's the thing. I know a lot of parents are very, um, because in my world, I see it where they don't want to give their children every, you know, I don't don't want my children to know everything yet. That's fine. If if your parent doesn't want to do that, but tell them to write it down and put it somewhere where you're going to be able to get it and not in a safety deposit box, because here's right. the problem. When you put it in a safety deposit box and your name is not on that safety deposit box, you can't open it. Oh, so that's not where you want to put it. Right. So you want to put it somewhere secure in your house, but make sure that somebody knows where it is so that if this does happen, mm-hmm. that they can can, you know, know where to go. And as a matter of fact, we do estate planning. I do estate planning for the, the senior population. And part of what I do is I give a booklet and, you know, we put in there where your assets are. We have a, a chart so that people know what your assets are. But I will tell you that I have now changed it or amended it to include a document that says, what medication am I on? Good. Who are my doctors? Good. Because we didn't know that either. Right. We didn't know. Right. You know? And so wow. because of all of that, good to I know, had no idea. but good to know. That's why I figured if, if, if I have any better guest, it's you that's going to be able to say, I've been through A, B, C, and D, and this is yep. what I've learned from those things. And so that's, I figured yep. you were going to be the most helpful to anybody listening today. Yeah. I mean, it's so important to make sure that you not, you have that information yes. for your parents. Yes. Because- if my father was out of it, I don't even know what we would have done. I know. I ended up staying with my dad for eight weeks. Mm-hmm. But what happened was a doctor came in from Mayo Clinic and I was sitting with my father and basically told me, my dad, that my dad had, they had tested his blood and he had chronic leukemia oh. and that he had three options. Option one is that he could go through chemo. Um, and if he wanted to do that, he'd have to do a bone marrow test so they could, uh, yeah, bone marrow or spinal tap, I don't remember what, I think it was bone marrow, uh-huh. to find out what kind of chemo, but that he would live maybe 10 months to 12 months, but he'd oh. be 
horrible shape. He would probably get infection. He probably would die from the infection, blah, 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 blah. He'd be immune compromised. Option two was that he could do transfusions. Um, but then he'd probably live another three months or option yeah. three was he could go home and die within days. Mm -hmm. And, um, my father who was diabetic and had AFib and all that decided that he was going to go home and die. And, and that put him through that, all that grueling, gruelingness that you have to go through just to extend think, your life. And I think a big part of that was that he had just come through what he was coming through. I think yes. that if that had just happened, I don't know if my father would have made the same decision, uh -huh. but he decided to stop taking all of his medications too, uh -huh. all at once. We went home with hospice. My father had a long-term care policy. So this is another thing. I mean, we knew... Thankfully, I had called earlier to know what his, his benefits were, or else I wouldn't have known. Um, but the long-term care policy only paid for six hours at $32 an hour oh. for my dad's care. But the long-term care policy or the, the company only did four-hour shifts. Oh. And if you changed it to three-hour shifts, it actually cost you more money per hour, which mm -hmm. was ridiculous. It yeah. was going to cost us more if we did six hours versus what it would cost us if we did eight. Mm -hmm. So of course we did eight hours, four in the morning and four at night. And hospice, when you go home with hospice, yes, you have a hospice nurse. You don't ever see the hospice doctor, but it took them two days to get there. They did get me a bed and equipment. I don't think people understand that's your hospice now. Yeah. And at the end, my father was in a lot of pain. They don't come and sit there 24 seven. They tell you how to give him morphine. It's incredibly frustrating. It's incredibly oh, hard. Um, like I said, 24 hours, my father's not getting oxygen. I would call. I was like, this is insane. This mm -hmm. is insanity. Um, also dealing with the banks. I mean, I had a durable power of attorney and, um, you know, we were trying to do stuff with the banks and I had a, a, a bank that was refusing to accept his durable power of attorney and I was fighting with them oh. and I'm an attorney. So I knew what I was doing, but I can't imagine a caregiver having to deal with all right. of that as well. Right. right. It's a lot. It's a so lot. I did, I, I, I stayed home. I stayed with my dad for the last seven and a half, eight weeks Yeah. with him. And even though I had care. And even though I had hospice, um, literally the aide would sit there and my father would scream for me to come get him a drink. Right. Right. Which is why in your mind, you thought I can't leave him now because he's not getting the help he needs. I've got to stay and do this. I've got to stay and do this. You have to stay and do it because right. even if you have hospice, they'll tell you, you have to have a caregiver there all the time. Right. You right. still have to have somebody there right. all the time. And it, even though my brother at one point had asked the nurse, the hospice nurse to move my father to a unit, which I wasn't, I really wasn't um, on board with that. She said, he's not sick enough. And it was oh. literally, my father literally lasted, um, I want to say six weeks in hospice and me taking care of him. And Amy, I did things for my father and for my father that no daughter should ever, ever have to ever deal with, have oh. to do, oh, ever righty. have to do. And, um, you know, of course it was always whenever the aide wasn't there, right. That my father need that type of Needed care. And even at like night, that. Oh my goodness. At night, my father would, um, especially towards the end would be trying to get up and he was 250 pounds of dead weight. And if he rolled off the bed or tried to get off the bed, I needed to try to go and get him, him back, back on, in, nudge him in. And it, it right. Was, oh. It was um, incredibly, incredibly challenging. And this is still fresh because he just passed. How long has it been? He died June 27th. Yeah. So this is still fresh. So you look at from where you've been, where you are now, what a survivor you are, what an example of a strong 
daughter and mother and wife and person and friend. And it's, it's put you through the ringer, no doubt about it, but you have learned so much that there's so much that you're going to be able to help other people with. So when you hear of a friend that's dealing with even a fraction of what you right now, I don't know. I don't think I know of another person that has dealt with what you've dealt with these past few years. So if you've gleaned anything, it's information that you can be loving and, and, and compassionate and share that information with somebody else. My hope is that you are taking time for yourself and that you're taking time to let your, your emotions and your inner strength and self-esteem and everything else to just get back, be able to take a breath so that you can be Heidi again. That's going to take time because you've been beat up. Well, you know what else it is? It's first of all, I have to be honest. Um, and this is something I think I have to give grace to anybody who also feels this way. And to, to myself is I have terrible guilt with my dad because the entire time I was there, I didn't want to be there. Yeah. I will be honest. I didn't, I was, I was, I did not want to be there. Right. I did not want to be doing what I was doing for my dad. And he had um, bed sores that had a horrible smell and I did not want to be there. And my father was not the loving, Oh, you know, you hear stories about, Oh, my father and I sat there and he told me how much he loved me. And we were having these moments, not my dad. That That was not my father. Right. That was not happening. My father, you'd walk in, he's watching TV. He never moved his head from the TV. Uh So I didn't have those moments. And so there were times I was like, please God, just take him. Take right. him. And also there was a feeling that I, I knew he needed to be with my mom. I mean, that was, you know, right. But you also so knew I that have, he was sick and not feeling good and really wanted him to be out of his yes. misery. You wanted yes. him to go yes. to sleep. I, I wanted him. And that was what we were basically told that my father would go fall asleep and, and that would be it. But that's not what happened. Um, so, but I have to, and, that, and that's another thing that caregivers have to really give themselves some grace. Uh, and I'm trying to give myself grace. Right my feelings um you know my father died and i i have a sense of relief um for many reasons um he's out of he's out of misery i think he needed to be with my mom again yeah so i think there's a lot of that but also it was it was exhausting it was exhausting it was exhausting and it was exhausting because you were previously exhausted from the previous exhaust before that exhaust so you really haven't had a chance for a very long period of time to really get Mm -hmm. it all back together again to take on another battle of any kind so by the time your dad got sick you were still just recuperating from your mom and still recuperating from your mom right yeah so this is the time it's it's okay to feel relief it's okay to feel. Yeah. Okay. And, but there's also a really weird feeling. Like I know people say you're not really an orphan, but you're, you're an orphan and you're, right. you, you have no parents and right. it's a weird. And I know, you know, because you've I lost do. both your mom. Yes. And dad also. Right. Right. And it's a very weird feeling to know that you have no parents. You're nobody's daughter anymore. I know. You know, right. It's a weird. You're, and now it's up to me and my brothers to make sure that we keep the family together. That right. was. And I think not, that was too, not in our- right. And I think your relationship, whether even being a mom at one point, then being a caregiver for your child, then you're the daughter and your mom's your best friend and your best friends and your mother and daughter. But then you became the caregiver for that. You know, then you became the attorney. Then it's with your dad. And now you're his care and his attorney and you're your brother's director to get. So you've had so many different hats. It's you just need to figure out where once all the dust settles where right. Heidi is in all of this. Where do you fit in? Where are you going to settle? Because whatever you do, you're successful at it anyway. You just need to give wow. yourself time to get to that point. Yeah. And it, and it is, it's, it's, you know, and you expect so much from yourself, especially if you're like the type A personality that I am. I'm like, yes. I, I should be able to be right back where I am and I'm, mm-hmm. I should be fine. And I should right. be able to handle everything that comes in. And I do, it's a, it's a, it's a weird thing. I'm able to handle it. And then when it's done, I'm like, Oh my God, how, how did I do that? What, right. what was that? Right. I didn't do that. You know, so it's, and again, I think a lot of caregivers go into this like mode of, of taking care of somebody. And when they're gone, I mean, I only took care of my dad for like eight weeks, but when I got back here, it was, I couldn't wait to get home. But then when I got home, I didn't know what to do with myself. Exactly. You have all this extra time on your hands. And I think that yeah. is one of the biggest parts. Like, 
Yeah. I, so I run three different support groups and I have to tell you, I deal with them as they're dealing with the person that they're caring for. Then once they pass, they still continue to come to the support group. And every single one of them say, I, I don't know what, when I get up in the morning, my first concern was, where's my wife going to be? What's my dad doing? You know, now they're gone. I don't know how to fill that void, but I right. think that you've just got so many um, wonderful things that you can do with your profession, with your children, with your friends, with your, you're going to find that place. And you're right. It's going to be a completely different thing. You're going to, who knows what direction now you'll go at this point. But I just think you were such yeah. a perfect example to be a guest on this show, just to show that you can be a caregiver. And in your case, 57 times, some people are just dealing with one person and you can still be a survivor and move on. And, and, you know, for anybody listening out there, you may have a million questions for Heidi. You may be between caregiving or even what she does with elder law and what she does dealing with those that are disabled. What's the best way to get a hold of you? Um, best way to get a hold of me is always through my office. Um, we have um, my phone number is um, 954- 866-1055. That's directly to my office. Or if you want to see what I do, I have a, a website, um, www.elderlawdept.com. Um, that's always a good way to get to us. Or if you want to reach out to me directly, which I'm fine with also, it's H Friedman, F-R-I-E-D-M-A-N, at elderlawdept.com. Heidi, you've been great. I'm so happy that we had you on. You're my dear friend. Thank you, thank you. And I'm just so proud of you. you. You've been through so much and you're still sitting there looking beautiful and successful as always. <laughs> so thank you so much right, for I'm being gonna, on the show. I'm a little bit about the beautiful, but thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and I'm so glad that you're doing this. And, um, you know, this is something so important that I think that people need to know. And, and you're awesome. Great. Thank you for thank watching you. our show. We hope that you found an answer to a question or a resource that can assist you. Our goal is to keep all of you that are caregivers informed, refreshed, and heard. We're here for you. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us with any questions. We have all the resources that you'll need. Please follow us on our Facebook and Instagram pages for the up and coming shows and events and support groups. Thank you for joining us and thank you for your support.